opening for Felicia Simonelli since I'm already moderating the, 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 uh, the panel later on. Felicia is like uh, 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 basically overwhelmed with uh, a couple of deadlines today, so we just decided that I would open directly uh, the meeting today. I'm here a senior research fellow and um, the head of um, uh, a unit that is quite broad, dedicated to global governance, regulation, innovation, and the digital economy. And uh, I'm very happy to host uh, uh, this uh, 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 workshop um, that basically uh, wraps up uh, uh, a, the Makers Project, which has been dealing with one thing that for uh, SAPS as well is, uh, is very, very important. And for me as a, uh, an academic uh, and also a think tanker, it's even more important uh, because some of the findings in this project are directly relevant for things that are on the table of the policymakers today. And I would probably exaggerate if I said that the ideas and what to do about those issues in policy terms are very clear in Brussels. To give you one example, I'm currently sitting as a member of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence of the European Commission, as well as the blockchain observatory and forum. And I'm also in, the, in, a, uh, in an advisory group to Carlos Moidas on the future of Horizon uh, 2020. It's called the ESIR group. And in all those aspects, we've asked ourselves, what are we gonna do and where can, where can Europe, uh, say, build its future competitiveness? And uh, how do we go about things like smart specialization at the local level, for example, uh, in uh, the context of, uh, of changing technologies uh, and in the constant of, of, of constant technological transformation? Um, the uh, answers are always very vague, and uh, the translation of these answers into concrete policy actions in the, in the short term and in the, in the medium term is equally vague these days. We have an upcoming strategy for artificial intelligence. Uh, the high-level expert group will pr produce policy and investment recommendations. It will include also funding recommendations, but also industrial policy recommendations. And there's a growing emerging uh, awareness uh, and uh, sometimes you close to wishful thinking rather than awareness of the fact that rather than going into the B2C world where that is pretty much busy already and, and quite, quite occupied, Europe could try actually to, to have a say in artificial intelligence, so not, not only as a global norm setter, but also in so-called industrial B2B settings and, uh, and in industrial platforms in particular in manufacturing, but also in other specific sectors in verticals such as healthcare or energy. So the idea of where in the industry can new technologies be accommodated to strengthen European competitiveness is something that is being done in a relatively piecemeal way uh, in, in the European policy debate. So having, I think, a breath of fresh air in academic terms and seeing where in particular at the local level, the makers has a very strong emphasis on place-based industrial transformation, uh, but uh, in particular at the local level, but also at the general pan-European level on how to conceive a structure and, and a strategy for industrial uh, transformation, uh, I think this is highly needed for uh, the receiving end, uh, not only for the ones that have uh, developed new knowledge in this research project. And uh, so I very much hope that through this workshop and also in the coming months, the most important findings of this project will be communicated uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the policymakers because I do think that there is a strong need for that. And uh, whatever comes in a more systematic, in-depth and academic way is, uh, is, is welcome. Um, the uh, past fate of uh, FP7 and Horizon 2020 projects has been uh, sometimes that of uh, reaching a peak in the moment of the, of the communication of the findings and then uh, uh, becoming quickly obsolete and not being communicated and reused. So on the side of SAPS, uh, what I uh, commit to do together with you is to help you also in, uh, in communicating these findings to the policymakers. That's, that's very important. Sometimes it's a matter of um, um, really capturing the attention uh, of the right people. Like um, neuroscientist Herbert Simon used to say, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and policymakers have an enormous amount of information on their table and content and reports and studies. Um, the Horizon 2020 projects in particular are made for uh, raising the quality of the debate when it comes to policymaking and understanding more in terms of research how to bring this forward, not only for academia in and of itself, but also in support of the, of the future policies. So 
uh, I think this is what we want to see today, right? Compared to the uh, past seminar that we hosted here at SAPS, today we come to uh, the, the end of the experience, uh, although of, of this round of experience, you never know. Lisa will tell us if they, what are the next steps after this. But uh, I call you to, uh, here to take the floor. You can decide whether to stand, to sit, to take the podium, or to be outside of the room, which is not our favorite uh, option. But you, we can still hear you because you will have a microphone. Uh, <laughs> Um, up to you. Your presentation should be up uh, any minute and you'll be able to move it with this wireless. I'm going to give you this microphone because that one's ICA that has a red light, which means it's probably out of battery. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, I just want to uh, start by saying thank you very much all for you to, to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to, to have you here and I would like to thank all those of um, makers that for uh, coming here today to mark really what is the final uh, uh, event of, of makers. It's the end but also it's the beginning of, of a new phase when we're trying to disseminate, share our, our uh, um, findings. I wonder if I could control my PowerPoint with this clicker. Would that work? Great. Um, first of all, let me say um, a couple of things. I would like to uh, uh, start by saying that the, the project has been running for, for three years. Um, and uh, um, it's been a pleasure to work with all the partners and all the researchers, the practitioner, the think tanker that have worked with us. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, first thing is, the, what is the project about? It's called Makers, and when we started this project in 2016, and when we wrote the proposal in 2015, we were in a very different world, a world where actually we were starting uh, talking about uh, Industry 4.0, about new technologies. Now everybody's talking about it. Now we are really in the middle of a huge debate. Lots of people have different views, but really we could start seeing where this is going. We looked at, uh, uh, we've been looking at this new manufacturing model from a number of angles. And we looked at skills, we looked at small firms, we looked at innovation patterns, we looked at reshoring changes in the organization of production inside the firm, outside the firm, but also globally. Will technology change how firm is organized across, across the, 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 the supply chain? Now, the project aimed from the very beginning to, I mean, this is a very uh, uh, naive um, aim, if, if you look at it, if you read it now, but imagine this was written in 2015, and it was really to unpack these issues, to look at, at what this new manufacturing model looked like, what are the issues, which are the drivers, which are the opportunities, but also the challenges that it, uh, uh, it poses to, to firms, to regions, uh, to government local government, to policy makers. And when I talk about firms, it's not just small firms, it's small and big firms. We need to remember that the economy, uh, there are, in the economy there are lots of very small firms. They are the backbone of the European, of European regions. And they have to really uh, jump on this, on this train in order to be competitive longer term and to produce and to sustain the jobs for their regions. The project really is a, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it has been underpinned by a network uh, which has involved universities, but also uh, policy makers and firms. It's multidisciplinary, multisectoral, and multinationals. Uh, 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 it has involved partners from uh, UK, France, uh, uh, Germany, Spain, Italy, um, Singapore, uh, US, uh, Sweden very much uh, a European and international network. And we all work together through a large number of researchers moving around, working in collaboration with each other. The starting point of our research has been manufacturing. It matters. It matters a lot for Europe. We knew this, but somehow we lost sight of it in the 1990s, where we thought, oh, well, we can just you know, um, make uh, stuff in, 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 in Asia, and we just, uh, as, as an advanced high-cost economy, we just innovate, we do the innovation, we do, we do the logistics, we do the, the, the marketing. But actually, what we realized, that is not working. That didn't work in 2008 with the financial crisis. The economy is not balanced unless there is a mix of activities, which give it resilience longer term, in particular times of shocks. And manufacturing still matters in Europe, and it is a very important sector, although smaller in size, 
than it was in the past. It's still very important for exports, very important for employment. There's a huge debate now, for example, in terms of jobs produced in the service sector, which was meant to be the, you know, uh, 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 the sector the, uh, where Europe uh, was meant to um, kind of concentrate its activities, uh, high income, high tech. But in fact, a lot of jobs in the service sector are click jobs. So in fact, we see that it's not true that service sectors is something where Europe can just constrain itself. But also manufacturing is changes, and this has been the starting point of our research. How is manufacturing changes with the new technologies? We know that there is a, a, a wave of new technologies coming to the fore. Um, um, somebody talks about the fourth industrial revolution, the third or the fifth. What is for sure that there is a technological revolution occurring. These technologies are everywhere around us. Some of them are not yet around us. They're still in the making. They're still part of uh, uh, prototypes, a part of basic research. Most of us know about you know, robotics, automation, space technology. All these are very important new technologies. We know that changing the way production is organized within the firm. We talk a lot, there's been a lot of discussion about smart factories, uh, light out factories, automation in factories, how this will change the value chain, the supply chain, for example, connected factories. But we very much think in, 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 in the Makers Project, we really have a very much um, uh, embrace the idea that part of these technologies are also about uh, green, is about sustainability. And these technologies will fundamentally change, should fundamentally change the way we do, not only we produce things, but also the products we use, the life we lead, some of the things we do on a daily basis will have to be fundamentally different. And we think there is a, an historical opportunity to reconcile economic growth uh, with a sustainable development. Until now, a lot of the debate around sustainability has been there's a trade-off between growth um, and sustainability. Economies have to grow less in order to accommodate uh, a kind of a, a, a green agenda. Well, we think that these technologies now, in particular, if we look at biotech, nanotech, green renewables, these will enable, if developed, uh, as they should, will enable new products, new processes, new ways of consuming, of accessing. And that would mean that growth can occur at the same time as a sustainable development. Where are we now with these technologies? Well, we are exactly in that, lit in that bit in the middle. We are where we see the current technological platform, the one we use, the technologies we are familiar with, they are becoming obsolete. They are exhausting their ability to produce, to create productivity, to benefit the economy. So we are in a phase of technological obsolescence. And we see new technologies coming out. There, are, there are radical innovations that we have started to, to, to see uh, uh, around us. They are embedded in some prototypes. They start to be embedded in some products. But they are not yet generally diffused. And we believe, with some example we have done, some case study we have looked at, that, of course, some sectors might adopt them quicker than others. Some places might adopt them quicker than others. And that means that the fusion and the adoption of these technologies will take a while. And only when these adoption, when the diffusion is somehow completed, we'll see the full benefit the economy will have in terms of productivity growth, in terms of really moving on to a new technological platform. Why there is resistance? Why are we not jumping from one wave to another? Because, of course, it's painful. We are now in kind of a shock and resistance phase. It, from a social point of view, there is a shock, fear about new jobs, fear about uh, new skills required, firms worried about which technologies to adopt, uh, uh, firms also resisting uh, um, taking risks. Because, of course, firms need to be somehow uh, 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 somebody needs to hold their hands, especially at times of very high risk. So we are at a time where there is some cost, social and economic cost, but as technologies will become clearer, some of the applications will become products, firms will see the market of these technologies, then of course adaptation will take place, and finally the technology will be embraced. At that point we will be in the full diffusion of these technolo technologies. 
until, of course, they mature. And then a new, probably, five phase of obsolescence will, will kick in. What is crucial is that the curve, the change from the radical to the incremental innovation will change, uh, will, will, might differ in sectors, might differ in regions, or might just simply depend on the pay, on the, the extent to which there is resistance in the systems. But also we believe in the role of the government. This is a time where governments need to be very proactive, very entrepreneurial, very interventionist in a sense, to really support firms at this time of high risk, but also of very much high gains um, if successful. So the, 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 the technologies which are part of the fourth industrial revolution will trigger what we believe being a techno socioeconomic paradigm shift. And we have kind of designed this idea that we need to look at industry 4.0 plus, much broader, more holistic understanding of it. It's not just about creating cyber physical spaces. It's not just about adopting automation in factories, which of course would be great, because it will increase the efficiency of firms, their competitiveness, and make them cost effective. But the technologies are there also to make a much bigger and more uh, uh, dramatic and disruptive change. And we have identified five areas which will have to be very much integrated with what we have called a green economy and society. It's not just, a be just about you know, uh, um, pushing or encouraging firms to uh, invent new products. It's also in educating consumers to change the way they consume educating consumers to buy this product, to really take the risk of exploring some new consumption patterns. So it's really a green economy and society which will deliver uh, what is very much uh, everywhere in all policy agenda, this is inclusive growth, is everywhere. What does it really mean? Because when you read stuff on digital technology, there's a lot of evidence that it might create digital divides. It might actually create uh, gaps which are widening as against creating inclusivity. So we might have situations where even digital technology is another reason for uh, 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 widening or creating a polarized society and polarized economies. So we have to be very much aware of that and work against this type of tendency. So uh, uh, we might much believe that technologies will create new markets. Firms will have to see the opportunity, of course. But in some cases, the governments can play a role in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, with procurement, in terms of really paving the way for a new way of, con of consuming. Uh, consumers are exposed to new channels uh, of consuming, using, accessing. Some productions now are becoming almost free. We know we can access stuff for free. There is this kind of a, you know, a zero margin of cost economy emerging. Very important. It will become bigger. But also firms have to experiment with new products, and we consumers have to experiment with new consumption products. For example, there is a, the technology is there for really making a shift in, from uh, you know, um, fossil fuel plastic to bio-based plastics. It's all of us trying to really make that shift as well. Because if demand is created, of course, production will, will, will come. So firms have to be pushed to create new products. Already we see digitally enable, enabled products and connected products. They become the norm. Again, experimentation, both on the production side and on the consumption side. But also servitization. We don't need to buy things anymore. Products can become services. The importance of really trying to understand new user, new consumption uh, channels. Not buying, but simply uh, user-oriented services. This means firms have to invent, create new business models which connect innovation, production, and consumption. If I want something which is for an, a res result-oriented service, for example, it could be a television, it could be uh, uh, anything, it means I can tailor that particular good to my, to my needs. Now, it means that the business model of that firm has to change dramatically. It cannot just produce a particular good in a standardized way, or even in a customized product at the margin. It has to be a truly personali personalized product. Now, these changes go far beyond the just adopting automation within, within factories. It means really changing dramatically the way production and consum consumption are interfacing. We see, we, have, we talked about in the, in the, in, in, in the project, uh, we, what I'm presenting today is a very small part of what we have produced as a, as a network. 
and you'll see a little um, a website which are, I take you, uh, these are the deliverables which are open access on the website. And uh, they are very much in, uh, in, uh, uh, connected to, um, that's where I've taken some of these uh, snapshots. So what I'm presenting here is really the tip of an iceberg in terms of findings. But I just want to give you a flavor of the extent of the research that has been carried out over the last 13, 36 <coughs> months. Uh, we've been looking at disrupting regions. A lot of Euro the European economy depends on the competitiveness of regional economies. They will be disrupted. So we have looked at how, at the regional level, stakeholders like university, government, businesses, but also society, have to interact and think differently to choose which path they can embark. We looked at, for example, uh, 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 what, what it means for, for the regions to create new paths, to embark on path renewal strategies. And we also looked at this through a number of case studies, and I've, this is a, a, a quick summary. We looked at case studies in Italy, uh, in, uh, in the UK, US, Sweden, uh, France, and, uh, and, and Switzerland. What is very clear across all the studies we have looked at is the importance of multi-level strategies. We can't uh, let just regional government, for example, think independently. They have to connect with the national level, and the European level is very important to give guidelines. We know how important uh, it is for regions to see, at, uh, to see what the new cohesion policies, for example, are going to look like. They look at those cohesion policies as guidelines for things they want to develop in their specific regions. So the importance of connecting European policies with national level policies, but then these have to be somehow translated into very practical applications at the regional level. And what we have designed is a kind of matrix where these things come together. Because of course we see at the national European level, it's important to have direction, a vision, an understanding of the key technologies which are emerging and somehow provide real institutional leadership in terms of institutions, in terms of key actors, and in terms of policies. These technologies are gonna be shaping everything we do produce, consume for the next 50, 70 years. Now, Europe has to develop these technologies, otherwise it will end up importing them because they will be basically the, the underpinning uh, uh, um, scientific base of, of, of everything we do. So at the national European level, understanding and developing these technologies and through policies which are really pushing uh, them is very important. But then of course these technologies have wider applications because they are enabling technologies. They will have to be translated in different sectors in different regions. And that's where policy becomes somehow uh, uh, an industrial policy which is place-based. And the connection between the places and the sectors are very important. But they're different. And I think it's also very important to stress, and we have done this in a couple of deliverables, try to really understand that technologies and sectors are different. There are technologies now which will be have wider application across a number of sectors. Of course, technology will disrupt firms. Some firms are already leading. Large firms in particular are leading. Medium-sized firms are starting to adopt. Very small firms are very much either learning what they need or very much resisting the change because it's too much for them. That's where policy really needs to be much more proactive and much more encouraging. Again, taken from another report within Makers, we've looked at one sector, but we looked at other sectors. For example, we looked at uh, the bioeconomy in Sweden, and I just picked one as an example. These new technology will disrupt sectors. This is, for example, sorry, on the left-hand side, um, you have the, um, the value chain of kind of, you know, petrol cars, um, and then see how different it looks, the auto sector in a kind of electric car scenario. You have completely different players, completely different technologies um, from uh, shared transportation, navigation system, you've got, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, you have 
lots of services. Now, this is important because we need to understand how sectors are changing. In Sweden, we looked at how the paper industry is changing, but the textile is changing. We had another example of textile. The auto sector is changing. So these are not incremental marginal changes. These are significant disruptive changes. Now, disrupting sectors also mean disrupting supply chains because, of course, that sector is made of a lot of component makers. A lot of services feed into, into those cars. They have to play ball. They have to be somehow encouraged to embrace this change. And we have, we have a number of studies uh, uh, in, within makers have looked at how technology will, for example, uh, um, is encouraging firms, for example, to reshore, to bring productions back from overseas into, for example, Germany, uh, Italy, and the UK. So firms are encouraged, uh, they see a benefit. So there is an economic uh, calculation in terms of uh, uh, shifting production back to, uh, to the home economies, or other cases where firms are not offshoring, they're onshoring. So even somehow stopping the offshoring is an important step forward. It means that UK, that the, the Europe is uh, um, uh, exploring opportunity to recouple innovation and production as both producing and creating value. And this is again quite something that we have explored with lots of case studies from the US, Germany, Italy, and, and the UK. This would disrupt global value chains. Because, of course, uh, we see an increasing trend towards production is moving closer to the final market. Production is becoming closer to consumer. That means, of course, uh, the creation of what we have called continental production platforms. So firms are uh, moving uh, production to Asia for the Asian economy, not to be shipping stuff back to Europe. Therefore, if you are producing, for example, for the European economy, then it makes sense to produce uh, uh, as well in, uh, in, in Europe. And we are, I mean, these are findings by in themselves. There could be new projects. This is opening all sorts of questions in terms of how do you do this and in what sectors it works better than, than, than others. Finally, to, uh, the, 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 we're working now on the policy aspect, and this is why Andrea was pointing to. We are pulling together all the recommendations coming from all the different themes and trying to identify important uh, uh, policy recommendations. We have identified a number of them and we have really uh, sought advice from national, regional and European stakeholders to validate our recommendation. We had interviews at the regional level, at the national level, at, at the European level, where we are trying to test whether some of our recommendations really are new, are uh, important, or, or if we have missed something out. What is very clear is that there is a, an increased attention towards industrial policy. The, the word, the concept of industrial policy is fashionable again, and this is very interesting, but it has to be transformative. We are at times of transformation, and this has to be somehow uh, crucially uh, 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 taken on board. But it also has to be place-based. And this is why we have coined this kind of phrase of a place-based industrial policy. Of course, regions, have their own embedded regional specialization. And this is what the smart specialization strategies are based on, looking what regions have and trying to really leverage those as strengths. But we would argue those specializations have to be transformed, not just marginally uh, upgraded, but we're talking about transformations here. And this is something that uh, uh, has to be done in order to um, embrace the technologies that are coming in from uh, the fourth industrial revolution. We have uh, identified seven key points, uh, which we uh, elaborate and expand in the report, but they, uh, um, they, they, I've summarized them in these bullet points. First of all, a much better integration of public and pri private uh, 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 support for the adoption of these new technologies. What it means is that, for example, large firms are adopting them, but also they are very often the uh, coordinator of supply chains. So the idea for them to become the push of uh, 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 components maker adopting these technologies. And we've interviewed component makers, for example. They say, well, until the buyer is telling me, I don't need to make any changes. So actually, firms who are coordinating supply chain, they have a huge responsibility for trying to 
show the way of which technologies they need their suppliers to adopt to be part of this transformation. Because of course, uh, uh, small firms need to make the change and that's where government steps in. Because small firms uh, require support. A lot of European economies have already uh, at the national level adopted the national plans for Industry 4.0. Uh, uh, France, Italy, Germany, of course, uh, uh, in part the UK, Spain, Sweden. So there are already national level framework, policy frameworks to support small firms to adopt these technologies. Because the risk, of course, is, is that large firms are, are changing, but the supply chain is not. And that would be a, a huge bottleneck. Skills comes up across every single interview, conversation we had, everybody's concerned with skills. Skills of existing workforce, skills of our children entering the workforce in 10, 15 years time. So the importance of training, new skills, but also retraining on the job. Very little is done to train the existing workforce on the job. Why? Because firms don't want to spend the money. Because they think, I am retraining X, Y, and Z, and then they can move. And this is the big, the big, the big issue. Training is very important. The green agenda has to be integral to every individual policy we do. Changing the value chain. Uh, understanding new value chains and how they have changed globally, how they, where are the new, the new uh, uh, points of, of, of excellence. Um, how can this transformative industrial policy, policy feed into the European smart specialization policy? This is something we are writing on at the moment, the importance of understanding transformation within something which is already well accepted, which is the European smart specialization policy. Of course, you can't have a digital revolution without really uh, having a digital uh, infrastructure which is uh, uh, important. There's already a, a huge digital divide, for example, between urban areas and rural areas. This cannot be. We need to, uh, to really tackle some important divides and investment in digital technology means investing in digital infrastructures. Finally, of course, try to show firms, in particular small firms, what are these technologies about. So demonstrators, accelerator centers, really trying to create prototyping, enables small firms to really, through government intervention, to understand what technologies they need to adopt to embrace this transformation. Now I want to finish with uh, a big thank you. Um, and I want to thank you all the partners that have been part of the uh, Makers Network. They've all been fantastic. It's been three years of a lot of fun, a lot of research, a lot of interaction. And I want to thank all the uh, admi administrators, all the think tanker, all the researchers that worked, and of course the project officer who's here with us today for the commitment and the enthusiasm they've really shown to the project. We worked together for 36 months. We had 35 researchers moving around Europe, uh, US and, and, and Singapore. We've done almost 200 months of mobility of secondments. We've published 16 reports. We have published 48 uh, publications, um, more than 200 presentations across uh, you know, international conferences, but also small workshops, for example, with local policymakers to really raise awareness. Uh, so these are really events uh, which have tried to engage and really uh, make the project impactful. And of course, we're coming out with a volume next year, which will be open access, uh, uh, um, which will basically pull together a lot of the, these issues. Um, my final slide is this one, and I've asked uh, all the people involved in makers, uh, um, or the secondees rather, to tell me five key words uh, that really summarizes what maker has meant for them. And this is the word cloud that emerges from that. As you can see, uh, a lot of collaborative uh, uh, stuff has happened, a lot of collaborations, learning, innovation, partnerships, knowledge, uh, enriching, uh, digital skills, networking. So I think everybody had a fantastic time really trying to share this concern for European manufacturing and technologies. And please, um, if you're interested, have a look at our website and definitely follow us and uh, more things to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think you can, you can stay there. There's no time for questions, but I think we reserve some time for questions uh, later uh, at the end of the panel. Uh, I will call out, this is Slava Kolarova, who has been uh, on the other side of... Oh, 
of defense for this uh, for this project, meaning on the side of, as a contact officer for the research executive agency uh, for uh, for uh, her presentation. Uh, thanks for being with us. This is not good morning, everybody. For those that doesn't know me, I'm the project officer. My name is Zislava Kularova, and uh, it was a big pleasure to support the project activities uh, during three years. I learned a lot. I hope you too. It was quite tough. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to SEPS organizing uh, this event. Um, I'm very happy to have a larger auditorium than the consortium because it's an opportunity for me to um, spread the word about RISE, the program that uh, funded this project, uh, especially today when our new call is open. It been open since three days, and um, for those which are interested, uh, it's open until April, and you can apply. First of all, I would like to uh, greet the consortium because it's a big uh, success to be part of Horizon 2020, Marie Skudowska Curie Action, being part of RISE. How RISE, what is it RISE about? Uh, RISE is funding uh, projects in it's a bottom-up problem uh, program funding projects in the field of research and innovation, and it's implemented through self exchange. In the case of makers, you were uh, working in economics on the manufacturer competitiveness, and uh, you implemented uh, almost 190 secondments, as Lisa said, intersectoral and uh, inter uh, and transnational. Those are the rise objectives to create collaboration, intersectorial collaboration, to boost career of researchers, early stage researchers and experienced researchers, to boost the collaboration across the globe, and to share knowledge, multidisciplinary knowledge. You comply with all the objectives. You created a large network of uh, <coughs> researchers, policy makers, and business leader working on the very relevant subject. And most importantly, one of your key uh, objectives was to advise the policymakers what step needs to be taken in order to increase the in, uh, industrial manufacturing uh, competitiveness in the European Union. This is very much appreciated because uh, uh, we are looking for a policy feedback to feedback to the uh, policy DGs in order to reshape the future programs. RISE, as I said, is based on secondment, intersectoral and international. You used both, and it was uh, very successful from the scientific point of view. As I said, you brought a large uh, number of actors. And also, once you said to me, Lisa, that uh, RISE is creating jobs, which is very positive as well, which staff can be exchanged. Those are all researchers with uh, experience, more experience and less experience. And I find uh, very good that uh, you th went through all the conditions, which are not so easy, and you manage second the right stuff, and uh, you manage very well. Thank you for this. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, on this side, uh, you can see uh, what was funded in this project. Uh, staff, uh, uh, top uh, allowances for the staff, uh, research training and networking, as well as some uh, management costs for the project. Uh, you manage very well the EU funding. Thank you for this, because for us it's very important. Those are taxpayers' money, and uh, it's important to manage them soundly, and that's why we were pushing for the implementation of second months. Also, as I said during our meeting, your feedback is very important to us in order to shape the future programs. As you see on this slide, we increased the unit cost for the code 2018. This is your project, the human face of the project, part of your consortium. The project was implemented by 16 beneficiaries and for uh, third countries, United States and Singapore. And this is the future. In case you are interested, the call is open 2009. The deadline is 2nd of April. 
next call will be open again the same time next year. And the good news is that this program is continuing Horizon uh, Europe. So uh, I would encourage you very much to apply it, to spread the word in the scientific community. Uh, what is RISE in practice? Uh, it's very simple. You need three independent countries, two of which should be member states or associated country. You have to have a good idea to propose and you have to have a staff to be exchanged. So the projects are running up to four years and uh, with 540 months which is quite a challenge. <laughs> in case you are interested, the whole information is on the participant portal. And uh, since you are an excellent researcher, you might decide to sign up as an evaluator or monitors for our project. In case you need more information, you can contact the national contact points. And this slide is summarizing what Lisa just said. This is the feedback from the outside world of the coordinators. What is right in few words? Collaboration, experience, innovation, coordination, and communication. And uh, I would like to show you a short film that we have prepared with the feedback from the coordinators on the program and uh, enjoy it. And thank you very much for the all work you have done. How to click on the how to click on the link? Thank you. The Research and Innovation Staff Exchange Program is part of a family of Mari Skwodowska Curie Actions. Researchers all over the world are traveling and working together. Since 2014, the European Commission has been funding the RISE program to enable researcher mobility. As a project officer, I like to meet the researchers behind our projects and learn about their experience. Uh, the RISE project is an ideal bridge between university and uh, industrial partners. It's very important for a company like Teneco to learn more about new control systems and new technologies. It's an open invitation for uh, researchers at the university to come to, uh, to have an industrial case, but also for researchers at the company to learn about new techniques. From the commercial perspective, the result of the collaboration uh, with the universities in the REACH project was we tested new advanced functions and integrated uh, chassis control functions. We tested it on the vehicle, like this one, and it finally resulted in a patent. Not only big corporations participate in RISE, but also small and medium enterprises. Smart Helmet is about developing systems and gaining insight to create bicycle helmets with improved thermal comfort. The RISE project is a project that focuses on collaboration. It allows you to, to understand other countries and cultures. Thanks to RISE, you are connected to a much broader field of expertise. I would recommend RISE for companies with a clear vision on innovation. Now we are at the University of Leuven to meet with Monica and David, collaborating on the RISE project, Papa Build. Our project is uh, related to uh, psychoacoustic and physical acoustics properties in buildings. We have found uh, RISE uh, as a European funding uh, where you can freely choose a topic. The RISE gives chance uh, not only to early stage researchers but also to experienced researchers to perform secondment. Another key type of organization that benefits from RISE are professional associations. The NanoGentles project addresses all of the challenges that nanomaterials face in reaching the market successfully. It brings together researchers and industry to understand how you safely develop a material. One of the good news stories that came out of the project directly was a colleague of ours who was coming to the end of her contract with us who got great experience while she was on secondment in Spain and was subsequently offered a job there. It's a real boost to her career to bring her industry knowledge into an academic setting and hopefully we can transfer the benefits across different sectors. Personal development. Friendship. Mobility. Discovery. Unifying.
All right, thank you and this, uh, for both presentations. Uh, um, we are a bit tight with the agenda, so maybe I'll ask Lisa to take, take a seat here because we will start with the panel. Uh, I will uh, call here all six panelists. Uh, this well, we are like some ten minutes behind schedule, but that was the easy part of the of the event because now we have six panelists in let's say well, slightly over an hour, <laughs> so so that's going to be even more challenging. Um, where's Peter Berkowitz? Uh, please, Peter, uh, head of Unit Smart and Sustainable Growth from DG Rijo. I will call John Zeisman. Uh, to uh, to take the floor, uh, you can pick uh, whichever color of the chair you prefer. I mean, uh, that's uh, we, we and Wim de Kinderen uh, from Bainport Eindhoven, um, Annalisa Primi from the OECD, and uh, Sandrine Laburi from the University of Ferrara, and Rosemary Coates from the Reshoring Institute in Blue Silk. Hello, Rosemary. So. I was fascinated by both presentations. I just wanted to, to add a couple of notes here at the margin. First of all, you all know how broad is the set of conclusions and the findings that come out of a project like this. Uh, I have been heavily involved in the discussions internally, in the, the particularly in the jury research on the future Horizon Europe, as I was mentioning before. And there, there are still candidates for deciding which topics would probably be more appropriate for the so-called missions. As, uh, or the moonshots, as they are sometimes being called, towards in the transition towards mission-oriented innovation policy, which is part of Horizon Europe. More specifically, within the one of the pillars of Horizon Europe, the societal challenges one, uh, one of the new features, one big new feature of Horizon Europe would be that there will be uh, quite uh, a big amount of money being dedicated to two or three missions. Um, some, some of you might have uh, followed the work of the ESIR committee or the Matsukato report that came out in February. These are all part of the same elaboration of a group of six, seven economists of which I've, be, I've been part. Um, industrial transformation in particular is so broad that it's one of the, the, the possible candidates for this. And uh, this would allow to have that, that minimum scale that is needed to, to bridge education research, innovation, and industrial policy all together and do something that is inclusive rather than selective and, um, and uh, brings industrial transformation at a different level of political commitment as well for the EU and member states. So we'll see what happens uh, in this respect. Um, second, I wanted to appraise the work of Desislava because people that have been leaders or that are now leaders uh, as, uh, as I am uh, in the position in which Lisa is of, uh, of uh, uh, large research projects I appreciate very much the fact that, uh, uh, that we have project officers that help us navigate to the, uh, through the uh, sometimes uh, uh, relatively frustrating uh, uh, bureaucracy and, uh, and set of conditions and rules that inevitably accompany these projects. So, uh, and these are typically humble and competent uh, 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 project officers and advisors. So humble that this is Lava decided to stay sitting and not even take the podium. But uh, I wanted to thank you and all your colleagues for what you're doing because I think it's, it's highly deserving. Um, now let's start with our panel. Um, I will start with Peter, um, who we've, you know, the receiving side has been evoked a few times, so I'm sure you've taken mental notes about this. And uh, uh, I will give uh, more or less ten, ten minutes each for the presentations and for the remarks. Uh, you are uh, uh, receiving this from the DG Regio side. I think it would be interesting to know also from you how you, you plan to face the new generation of blending instruments between the regional policy and the uh, and the research uh, policy funding, at the same time, uh, maybe, but th this is necessarily not necessarily something you have to cover in your presentation. But from Lisa's presentation, it was uh, talking about green transitions and uh, sustainability. Uh, the other thing that most uh, uh, analysts and experts and academics are are uh, observing right now is whether the European Commission will be able to really uh, walk the talk, as sometimes people say, in mainstreaming sustainable development goals into the, the cohesion funding and regional policy. And uh, this, I think, is highly relevant with respect to the findings of makers. And uh, also, I would be extremely curious to know how DG Regio is getting ready for this that sometimes we call Agenda 2030. But that's not a mandatory, uh, let's say, question. You're free to take it. So floor is yours, Peter. Thanks for being with us today. You, of course, you feel free. I mean, this is SEPs. Uh, we tend not to constrain too much the speakers. You can also speak from the back. You can walk around. You can do whatever.
All right, what I suggest to do is when we move to Annalisa, uh, I, will I will collect the first three presentations and then maybe I'll open the floor to quick uh, questions and then move to the, the, the second batch of three speakers. Annalisa, you can choose whether to speak from the chair. You feel comfortable there. Go ahead, no worries. And uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, a big, uh, real pleasure. Thanks, Lisa, for uh, for bringing me in this group. And uh, um, I was thinking what I can share from the kind from the work that I do at the OECD Development Center. And I chose um, three couple of words um, that I think can help us to think forward and that are very much linked to the results uh, of the project uh, that, uh, that Lisa has been uh, showing us. But first, let me tell you how I'm coming into this discussion. In the OECD, we set up in 2013 a policy dialogue on global value chain, production, transformation, and development uh, because we had a demand from countries with in the OECD, but also with China, South Africa, Brazil, countries that we work with as partner countries to better understand how the global environment and the global economic landscape was evolving and what uh, countries could do. We started with what can we do with global value chains? How can we enter, move up, make it sustainable? Then when we started to discuss, I come from an industrial economies background, so I was not very comfortable with the purely a value chain approach because I felt it was too much trade oriented and uh, a little focus on the creation of capabilities to then uh, export and uh, be engaged in broader global production networks. So then we slightly moved into looking about production transformation and then how we created a new tool in the OECD, which is a new review. Uh, because we surprisingly found that even though the OECD does many reviews in investment, in trade, and all the policies, uh, skills, uh, uh, education, there was nothing that was taking the production challenge. So what about the production and innovation system and what can policy do about that? So this is the work that we are doing now. We just implemented one in Chile. We work at the national but also the regional and city level. We will soon release a review on Shenzhen, China. So uh, I hope that the kind of work that we are doing could contribute and feed into the discussion. The three couple of um, words that I chose is, one is about the value creation process and technological convergence. I think this was very clear from Lisa's presentation. The analysis, production is back into the analysis. We have to look at the process of value creation takes place and the new technology and the technological convergence between the tangible and intangible dimension is reshaping the processes of value creation and how and who captures this value. Because in this initial part of the analysis, we're focusing on how a manufacturing is changing. So what are the new skills that are needed, where and what are the factors that drive the decision to locate production in a certain place versus another, how to make it more competitive or how to make it more sustainable. Uh, but there is an issue about uh, how this can, who is really capturing the value that is created and what kind of economic or social or environmental value uh, we are creating. And I think these are two things that we have to take into account because the potential benefits will come by looking at this technological convergence. On the point that you made, Lisa, about uh, this, the greening and the fact that there is an immense possibility to uh, totally reshape what we consume, how we consume, how we organize our cities, how we organize our territories, there is a strong linkage eh, between production, manufacturing, and territorial organization, the urban divide and all of this, this could be reshaped. Eh? Factories could be smaller, they could be like relocated back in cities. Actually, we are seeing this in small parts of the world, not everywhere, but we see tendencies of this. So this will change the relationship to on the, with the territory. But on the green side, uh, I am less optimistic <laughs> than what I've seen in, in your presentation, at least by working at the global level with many countries. So maybe this is an area where, frankly, Europe could be and could make a difference and take a lead because uh, I see this a lot in policy declaration, in some kind of policy tools and incentives, but I would not say that this is a major priority everywhere. While I, I guess, at least in this room, we all agree it should be, but I would not take this for granted. I think this technological convergence could totally bring us in another direction. The second couple of words I chose is uh, evolution and resistance, and this is really linked to what, uh, what you were mentioning. You mentioned a lot about uh, there is resistance uh, when uh, new technology appear. And, uh, 
And I think that this is not only something that we face at the level of firms and at the level of the innovation and production system. This is also something that governments are facing. And when we want to translate the discussion of what can policies do about it, we have to think that within the governance structures that we have at the local level, at the regional, at the multilateral level, or at the national level, governments will also have to see how do we move about this push for promoting evolution versus forces that could be uh, generate resistance. In certain cases, resistance might not be so bad because with the new technology, especially with AI and digitalization, some resistances are appearing on the side of privacy or how and what are we using these technologies for. And so we, we have to balance this because from the innovation point of view, of course, we, we like the evolution and eh? we like to create a break and go ahead. On the policy side, we have to maybe bring back values in the discussion to see where to strike uh, the balance. And, and in terms of policies, when you look at the reality that you analyze production and manufacturing, we see that with these new technologies, you basically have three types of actors. Eh? You will have those that are, they don't see the the issue. Maybe in Europe there are a lot of innovators and there are a lot of innovative regions, but what Peter was also saying is, look, there are also regions that need to face industrial transition. I do work with many countries in Latin America, Asia and Africa, and these issues of Industry 4.0 are seen as very far away, even if they should not be. Eh? They should be uh, a concern for everybody, but there are actors that don't see this issue, or they see this as a major threat and so they see it far. Then we see actors that see it, but they find it extremely difficult to adapt, or because of the capabilities, or because the organizational structure, or because of the environment where they are. And then, of course, we see the disruptive ones, uh, those that see those things that go ahead and they, and they advance. And the policies, we'll have to think about these three. Huh? So, of course, we need the mission-oriented and the big things to support the disruptive, but we also have to think about what do we do with those that are really far behind, and what do we do with those that really see the possibility that could be some kind of quick wins, uh, but that cannot do it for internal or external factors. And this is, I think, it's the, a very weak link in many policies around uh, the world, at least. Uh, these are, this is the area where I think we have been focusing less. And the third couple of words is about markets and trust. Because all of these issues that we are looking at, it's a total redefinition of uh, how businesses is organized. This will impact our lives and uh, what we consume, and how we produce, where we live, and. Uh, ultimately the quality of our lives and our jobs. So these major changes, we have to look at them in a broader context. This is a look at what's happening globally, like this, um, the rise of China, the tensions with the US. We really have to think about this in a global landscape and bring back a discussion between markets and trust because we do need trust to make markets work. And of course, we want to live in an environment where markets could be or borderless or that uh, uh, we want to see good innovation flowing and being adopted uh, everywhere and we want to see business opportunity not limited by boundaries, but we also have to realize that in the current situation, the trust that has been built after the Second World War as a system, a multilateral system that was there to support this, it's not as strong as it was and it is under big discussion. And, uh, and these, I think, we have, to, we have to bring some values back in the discussions. I, wa I was remembering about, uh, there is this Italian economist from Naples. I'm from Rome, so I'm not quoting a purely, <laughs> uh, like, uh, only hometown reference. But there is this economist, Antonio Genovesi, which is in 1700. He was a very liberal economist, slightly before Adam Smith. Uh, and of course, he was talking about the benefits of trade. But still, in, in, an, in this analysis, he wrote a book about lessons on trade. Therefore, these are lessons about civic education. Eh? So being educated to be in a, in a, like a civilized society. And his view was we need free trade, but at the end of the day, the trade has to be oriented by some notion of common good. And this is something that I feel has been a bit lost and uh, I don't really think that the inclusive dimension purely captures that. Because I think one thing is to agree that there is a common good. The other thing is to say, okay, this is our world, let's make it inclusive, I'll include you. But then who decides 
to include whom. So the discussion that I think we should be having, it's a, a bit broader about what and how this technology could help us to make rethink a world in which we define something that is a common good for all the different uh, countries and places that exist and that hopefully can have better lives thanks to new technology and new manufacturing. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and you'll certainly get questions, but uh, we want to hear from Bim uh, before. Uh, Bim, thanks for for uh, uh, joining us, and uh, we, uh, we look forward to your thoughts also in reaction to what. Do you want to go to the podium again entirely free? Yeah, great. Contrary to Peter, I don't have one slide. I have 28, which I'm not going to show all, <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Might be smartest solution. I guess I was asked here to give a kind of a real-life illustration of a few of the topics uh, which were um, discussed during the project and which are in the policy recommendations. This is, a, this is the set of slides that was used when I met David uh, Bailey from Ashton University, and that was when he invited me to come here. So I'm Wim McKinder working for Brainport Development, which is the uh, executive agency of the Brainport Foundation, and that is a triple helix uh, board for the Eindhoven region. So this is already a clear sign of collaboration in the region. And who are we, for those who don't know? We are situated in the south of the country, close to uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, a small region. Uh, the core figures are there, and we are a knowledge-intensive manufacturing region, so we are a, really ma a real manufacturing region, but um, based uh, strong in high-tech. So almost half of all patents being registered in the Netherlands originate from the Netherlands. And then the issue is what do you do with knowledge if you don't translate it into value? What do you do with growth? Uh, not in this picture, but last year we grew with 4.9%, which is rather good in the European context. Um, but what do you do with growth? Uh, I was very happy to uh, learn that our board in its last meeting and better late than never, I would say, started to discuss the SDGs, that how could we link to the SDGs and contribute to them. So it's a new discussion for us, but I think an important one. Um, here you see that this knowledge is being translated into value, and the value, the added value of industry in the Netherlands is getting more and more concentrated, and my uh, talk will be very much about place-based issues. So the big black uh, spot, that is the eastern part of the province of Brabant, which is, which is us. So you see that the uh, indus industry is concentrating on uh, even more than it was before in the Netherlands over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, we used to be a very famous one-company town. Uh, Philips uh, rings a bell, probably. Today, we are very happy that we have a more diversified <laughs> economy. This is the, the family tree of Philips, all kinds of companies that have an origin to be found at Philips. Philips itself is not no longer a lighting company. Uh, Philips lights, lighting bulbs are not Philips anymore. It's just a license uh, that was uh, sold to uh, Signify last year, basically. Philips is now a healthcare company. And you see these companies here, they're large companies, all in their own value chains, but in different topics uh, in high tech. Here, uh, you see that we have been adapting. We have, we have our own smart specialization strategy, which has changed over the years. And uh, not going into the details, but important on the bottom line is the collaboration. It all really builds on a very deeply rooted culture of trust and collaboration, which we believe uh, that is to a very strong uh, degree the, the basis of our success. And that translates into a number of iconic products uh, that you see here on the slide, and I will be talking a little bit uh, about the big machine uh, on the, the top level, which mentions the ASML uh, words. Um, and this is uh, what we are strong in today. Um, this is more the, the, key, the key, and please tell me when I'm running out of time. Um, this is the supply chain of our OEMs today. Um, in the past, until the 80s, I would say maybe a large company such as Philips 
was doing all themselves from basic research. They had their own uh, uh, university, basically, like really basic research up to the sales and service. And they started, uh, they started outsourcing, but now it's no longer purely outsourcing. It's really an open innovation development of their products. Uh, it's co-creation in a trusted environment with their, uh, uh, all the suppliers you see here. Um, well, I'm not going into this. These are all the reasons why. Basically because innovation goes too fast. They are not able to do it by themselves anymore. And a nice example on how this could work is ASML. ASML, by the way, is a uh, spin-off of Philips because it didn't fit their portfolio. Uh, now this company is bigger than Philips. Um, they may regret having taken this decision. I don't know. Um, ASML makes wafer steppers. Wafer steppers, the semicon industry. So they, these machines are the ones <laughs> that produce computer chips. So your computer chips in your phone are produced on that kind of machines. And this company, Eindhoven based, has a global market share of more than 90%. There are only three companies in the world which do this. Uh, and ASML have basically has everything. Um, they are actually also, before I forget uh, telling, they are very much uh, uh, starting to contribute to the energy challenge, for example. Uh, we have a, uh, a photonics cluster, a photon delta, in, in our region. Uh, that Peter knows very well. Um, we are very strong in integrated photonics and we are building, we have started a cluster to translate this knowledge more into economic value. And one of the companies in that cluster is Smart Photonics and ASML a few weeks ago bought a share in, uh, in, the, uh, in the company. Because if uh, all scientific uh, predictions would become reality, I would say, the, uh, so what does integrated photonics do? They transmit data through light and no longer through electronics. And it means that not only uh, things, uh, there will be more capacity, uh, but the energy reduction can be up to 95%. And we all know how much energy data centers, etc., cetera, uh, consume. So they are also going to contribute to this challenge. ASML is a nice example of, a, of an innovation ecosystem in itself, with all partners, uh, uh, as you see here, um, largely concentrated in our region. That's the, for us the strength of regional policy, um, but also globally, of course. Um, one of the things they do with these people, but also open to new suppliers, is that they started uh, last year, it's in development, a platform where <coughs> companies, SMEs, can actually uh, profile their competences so that the company can really look for the new competences that are needed. And interesting is that also the University and the University of Applied Sciences are part of the platform, so they can really get real-time uh, knowledge about what the industry needs in terms of competences, and then they can adjust their uh, training programs to that to make sure that their students are uh, really able to enter the companies without any additional uh, trainings needed. Um, this is an interesting one, I think, on the resilience as well. Um, this ASML is uh, very uh, vulnerable for global uh, the cycle that we all know. Uh, 2009 was a dramatic year. Uh, there was uh, no orders uh, on the in the books, so a little bit of panic back then. But the thing was that uh, also a number of their suppliers suffered largely. And then they changed their internal policies. Now today, uh, a supplier from ASML is not allowed, it's an internal policy of ASML, but it has a huge effect, uh, can no longer have more than 20% of its turnover uh, linked to the ASML contract. And that has, as a result, in the other crisis uh, around 2012, um, the company suffered, but no uh, supplier, uh, had suffered majorly. I mean, they all survived in a good way. This is not only a matter of resilience, it is also a very smart way for ASML as a company to make sure that their suppliers have other clients as well. So they really tap into the knowledge of all, all that world that they are not uh, directly related to. This shows that it's very much regionally based <coughs> still. And then I think we are also working, and that's the last, I'm proud of this. Um, we are a member, ASML does, doesn't need us, but um, 
in a number of sectors, every region in Europe is strong in something, but there is hardly any region uh, s strong enough to face global uh, competition, basically. So on the basis of our complementary smart specialization strategies, we started the Vanguard Initiative uh, four years ago, bringing together today 35, this is already all 35 regions, which collaborate on topics they define. But basically the agenda is the indus industrial innovation agenda, and uh, for example, we are leading a, a, a pilot on 3D printing with Flanders, and there we try to strengthen. It's not our job as regions to do that, but we facilitate companies and universities to, uh, to, to facilitate the emergence and the strengthening of the 3D printing value chain in Europe. And a last, also referring to uh, another result of this project, but a nice example of reshoring, uh, signified the new Philips Lighting started a, uh, a 3D printing manufacturing company in Eindhoven two years ago, um, reshoring their activities. So they had co activities in China before and they did the, the analysis and the cost uh, benefit analysis and they decided it would be better to have it uh, basically produced in the Netherlands, um, including a whole circular economy aspect. So all the light armatures basically that they produce uh, are brought back to the company and shredded um, uh, it can be made, uh, used as new material again for the next generation of uh, 3D printed uh, lights uh, applications. Well, maybe, I hope, a lot of questions uh, on the basis of this uh, presentation. Slides will be shared. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's uh, briefly open the, the, the floor. Uh, please ask, uh, if possible, short questions uh, uh, or clarifications. Yeah, there's one, uh, Walter. Please introduce yourself, even I called you by name. <laughs> Please use the mic. And the, the reason why we always want to use the mic is that there's people remotely connected. So, Representing the Nairo, the Business University from the Netherlands, there is an uh, issue that comes across in many of my students' projects, and that is the link that was referred to by Lisa already, that it is a techno-economic system, it is a techno-institutional system. So every time our government asks for innovative procurement projects and the likes, that's great. But all the rules and regulations are still Industry 3.0. Where is institutional maintenance on the agenda? Yeah. Otherwise, small SMEs can't move forward. They are hindered in their development because of the rules and the regulations that were optimized for the past era. That's where I think we have to spend a lot of work, attention, and time to fix. Thank you, Walter. Let me see if there are other questions or comments. There is one here. Again, introduce yourself to the audience and we'll speak. Uh, Kurt Geisert from Backbone Consulting in Germany. I have a question uh, for Mrs. Uh, Kolarowa. Uh, you are from the Research Executive Agency. We had recently uh, in the Charlemagne Building uh, Conference, there was somebody from INEA Innovation and Networks uh, Executive Agency. Is that a different field of activity? Uh, there are also research projects. <laughs> All right, I assume the first question was more for Peter. Uh, and uh, I don't know if someone wants to tackle this. Uh, you want to respond to that as well. Peter, do you want to tackle this question? from Walter on uh, procurement. You already alluded to the need for experimentation, the need for more flexibility no, in... No, I, I, oh. I think we agree. I think, we are. I think the, the, the issue is how to get to it. And I think that there is a translation of the regulatory environment which is happening um, simply by changing the economy that the operation no longer becomes a problem.
Thanks, Vim. Do you want to uh, comment on this as well? And then we move to this is lava for. Uh, you Not also. immediately related to the question of uh, innovation in procurement, but to policy innovation in general. I think I think it's uh, the team of Peter has proposed uh, an excellent uh, new program within cohesion policy to stimulate uh, the kind of activities that I was explaining from from what we do in Eindhoven in collaboration with many uh, partners in other European regions. And um, we can only see that in the, in the negotiations in the Parliament, in the Committee of the Regions, in the Council even, and the Netherlands is a fine uh, exception to that because they're fully supportive. Um, but policy, it's a rather conservative world. <laughs> um, I can go and give you many more details, but let's keep it to that. But it's, it's, our, it's all of our responsibilities to really address our policy makers on every level, from low, starting at local level to the European level, to make clear that we really need this and that is not a negative comment on other uh, parts of policy instruments, but to embrace this uh, new, uh, new, more innovative uh, kinds of uh, trying to support innovation. Yeah. Thank you. Annalisa, you wanted to say something. I do a lot of work on with the Regulatory Policy Committee at the OECD. We spent two days last week discussing experimental policy making and adaptive policy making. Uh, there's a lot of work to do there, and <laughs> yeah, well, what we yes, definitely. What I wanted to say is to thank to bring this <coughs> issue on the floor because we do it when we do our production transformation policy review. We actually look at the regulatory framework and uh, and to see how the current uh, regulatory framework is aligned with the ambitions of the or the innovation policy or the new trade policy or the or the industrial policy. So I think it's an important issue that needs to be analyzed. Uh, for us, what we see when working with emerging and developing economies is that you have two <coughs> issues. One, it's an important uh, area of development cooperation that is happening and exchange between a lot in Europe, uh, but also I mean Germany, Korea. Uh, I mean, there are many active countries in this that are sharing uh, lessons and helping countries to fast track modernization and regulations. The other issue is, how how we do that in a way that we change the way in which we think about the regulatory framework because a lot of the previous paradigm was based on national and in certain cases uh, slightly supranational regional level but uh, this new digital paradigm also requires the regulations that would enable us to work at the global level and there we miss the institutional space for doing that so this is a major issue that we have to to tackle because this will be a barrier in the future Okay, um, we could certainly continue in that conversation, and we probably will. Uh, then I move to this Islam, and then there's a final uh, tiny question, short question, uh, that uh, that I will to allow. To reply we'll to your on. question, there are six executive agencies, and they are all different, uh, managing different part of Horizon 2020. Mm -hmm. INEA is managing uh, mostly projects in the field of um, <coughs> transport and energy. So mostly the. If you need more information, I'm open after the discussion. All right, please introduce yourself. And Th yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Stefan Kinkel. I'm from University of Applied Sciences in Karlsruhe, Germany, and I was responsible for the work package on reshoring in uh, the Makers Project. So my question goes to Wim, of course. Um, you mentioned the reshoring case of uh, Philips uh, bringing back uh, some production because of new technology uh, uh, potentials and possibilities. Uh, what was the influence of, of the regional network for this reshoring decision. And the second, maybe more complex question, uh, did policy, and also the question, should policy support such reshoring initiatives, or do you think it should be on the company decision level? Now this was this was very much a, a, a company decision, but I we did have a talk with Philips uh, three years ago at the early stages of the Vanguard initiative. Actually, it's funny to see that in this family tree of Philips, you see the company Shapeways. Shapeways is a is an original Philips company. Philips Lighting in Eindhoven did not have contact with Fi Shapeways in Eindhoven. <laughs> they talked to us, the regional development agency, to look for contacts in Europe. How they could be helped um, in their 3D printing ambition. 
At the end, those talks, there were some talks with HP, for example, but it didn't lead to anything. At the end, they just did it themselves. Um, so it's not, is it a regional product? I don't know. Is it something for the regional, uh, a, a, a new light for uh, to be replicated later? Definitely, I think. In this, I mean, the whole system is a bit science fiction maybe for the moment, but of the urban, manuf or urban distributed manufacturing with uh, the smaller printing shops, but I'm talking about high quality here within the urban centers. I very much believe in that, yes. And that's what we are contributing to, to some extent with this uh, European network that I was mentioning. But the, this particular case was very much a company decision. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. So thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you who asked questions and thanks for the answers. So we move to Sandrine, um, who's a professor of economics, uh, University of Ferrara. And uh, Sandrine, the floor is yours. Uh, we have, where you have. I'll be very short. <laughs> ah, as you wish, as you wish. You Thank have you. Your <laughs> ten, your full ten Thank you. So I'm very happy to be to be here because I worked at SEPS uh, a long time ago. <laughs> After my PhD, I'm not going to tell you when because uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm getting old. Um, so I am going to uh, comment on uh, on Lisa's presentation, uh, building on um, experience of uh, regional industrial policy. I have been involved in, in together with Patrizio Bianchi, who's. Uh, um, Minister of the Regional Government in Emilia Romagna in Italy. So uh, we are, uh, as a professor, which is still uh, he, he does research with me, uh, but he's also a policymaker. So it's um, fantastic. Uh, we've also looked at uh, experience uh, of um, uh, industrial policy at regional level in other regions in Europe and uh, and uh, outside. Um, we've just published a, bo uh, a book about industrial policy for the manufacturing revolution, so we are really working on these issues, and uh, I thank uh, Lisa for inviting me for this. Um, so, regarding the policy implications of, um, of uh, your project um, and lessons from the policies implemented uh, in, in uh, different regions, um, I think um, there are uh, two major points. Um, so one has already emerged in the in the discussion. It is uh, the coherence, uh, policy coherence in the multi-level uh, governance framework, uh, local, regional, national. Uh, there was a question about the, the uh, about this. You have. Um, in your presentation, a matrix of uh, transformative uh, policy. Uh, and I couldn't see any link between the regional and national, and I think that is very important, okay? Um, uh, and for sure, uh, experiences of um, uh, industrial policy implemented in uh, different regions which have been successful uh, generally are extremely coherent with the national action, okay? Regions working in coherence with the national actions. And that's actually the case of the Emilia-Romania region, although in Italy we cannot really um, uh, consider that there is a national industrial policy, there is not an in a national industrial policy, but uh, the Emilia-Romania region has um, uh, defined and implemented actions uh, mobilizing the, govern the government, the national government sometimes. And one is um, uh, ensuring one of the key conditions for adapting to the Industrial Revolution, which is um, getting um, the infrastructure, getting um, uh, the raw material of the new uh, of the new era, which is big data. The um, Emilia Romagna region has appl um, uh, applied, um, has been candidate uh, to become a European Center for Big Data Analysis on uh, medium term weather forecast. Okay, so it has put together a huge infrastructure, both uh, tangible and intangible, all the computers and all the uh, also research capacity and uh, competencies, right? And uh, it did that um, talking to the national government and uh, inducing the national government to provide also financing and, uh, and uh, resources. Uh, so this, is, this, uh, this aspect is very important. Second aspect, uh, skills, people. This is really um, a big emphasis of the of the regional industrial policy in Emilia Romania, because uh, as uh, you stressed, firms cannot change without appropriate skills. Uh, okay, um, and uh, also. Um, 
disruptive changes cannot be addressed without appropriate skills, without appropriate uh, learning. Uh, what um, industrial revolutions, past industrial revolutions, have shown that uh, these um, very disruptive changes um, create high risk of uneven development across regions, but high risks also of social fractures. Do you say that? That fracture? Fragmentation, fracture, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so, um, addressing skills, uh, meaning uh, changing the um, uh, educational system, if need be, at all levels of, uh, of education is very important to prepare people for these changes, okay? Um, uh, so people need um, a narrative about change that, uh, that make them less fear fearful and uh, uh, less uncertain about the future. Uh, and then another aspect is that I think you, you stressed it in, uh, for, for greening, uh, greening industrial development, right? You said there is a, change, uh, a need for change in consumer behavior. Uh, in fact, we, uh, uh, environmental policy cannot be only um, supply side, but it has to be the dem demand side. I mean, uh, uh, we will never get um, sustainable if, uh, if people do not act, behave, and want sustainable uh, things. Uh, and this is also an aspect um, uh, related to skills because it is related to uh, education, right, of people starting from elementary school. So, um, um, if, to, be, to be quick, um, uh, industrial policy in the Emilia-Romania region has been defined in the Labour Pact in 2015, the last version uh, of it, okay, to express this um, importance of, uh, I would say, policy coherence between policy areas, social, education, importance of skills, as well as um, industrial innovation policy, right? It is expressed in the Labour Pact, also um, uh, um, uh, showing the importance of people. Um, uh, we do this industrial policy to, uh, to ensure jobs to people, okay? Um, and uh, it has four main elements, I would say, very quickly. Capabilities, networking, policy coherence, and uh, participative governance. Um, it has been defined involving uh, regional stakeholders and also outside stakeholders, okay? Um, policy coherence is policy coherence between the different fields of policy and between the different levels of policy. Capabilities is, okay, building R&D capabilities, inducing investment in, in R&D, but also skills. And uh, an educational reform has been implemented actually sin since uh, 2010 in the um, Emilia-Romania region, starting from um, elementary school. Uh, um, okay, um, and uh, um, networking is extremely important um, in order to identify and uh, exploit complementarities, new cl complementarities that are needed in, in times of uh, disruptive change. What I mean is that um, the, um, uh, the, the region has built a competence map uh, identifying all the competencies in, in, in industries, present in industries in the region, but also in research uh, and education in the region, and has uh, created networks, networks between firms, networks between universities, between high-tech um, institutes, so between education um, institutions, and also overlapping between them. So uh, the competent ma map has um, allowed to identify 27 global value chains. Uh, the region has identified these global value chains, which, uh, um, uh, which it calls communities. And uh, so for each global value chain, strategies are, are, are defined. Um, and all the, um, uh, the research, uh, teaching, um, universities, high-tech institutes are um, uh, closely linked with these global value chains, okay? So networking within the regions and outside the region. Extra-regional um, uh, links, uh, collaboration are extremely important in, in, uh, in case of, uh, in, in this uh, 
um, context of uh, disruptive uh, changes, and the Emilia Romania region is also a member of Vanguard. Uh, as uh, Wim, uh, Wim says, uh, this is uh, Vanguard is uh, is aimed at uh, pushing industrial application of research, and it is really bottom up because they, 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 the different regions uh, induce uh, businesses to. Uh, to come and talk together and uh, and find uh, ways to develop prototypes and uh, and industrial application. Okay, so um, uh, I'll stop there. Otherwise, I'll be too long. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move now to Rosemary Coates, uh, another of the makers. Uh, you go to the podium, uh, Rosemary, and. Uh, I personally am curious to know what blue silk consulting is, but uh, that, uh, <laughs> as I can ask you later. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. We're going to focus on the Reshoring Institute today. Uh, these are turbulent times in America, as you can imagine. <laughs> we wake up every morning and wonder what the tweet's going to say. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about the Reshoring Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in the US and we have two uh, missions. One is to provide uh, research and assistance to companies that are bringing manufacturing back to the US. And the other is to educate graduate students uh, about graduate students as interns about the manufacturing environment because over the last 20 or 25 years, in America, almost nothing was taught about manufacturing. It was much more about how to offshore and so forth. So we're, we're exposing students to manufacturing environments because we know they're gonna be the manufacturing leaders of the future. Okay, so manufacturing in America is hot. <laughs> wow, it's on fire um, for a number of reasons. <laughs> And the tax reform is probably the biggest uh, reason why um, the U.S. is now, manufacturers in the U.S. are now investing uh, in manufacturing and expanding their, their facilities and um, introducing new technologies and so forth. The corporate tax rate was reduced to 21% recent, recently, which puts us squarely in the middle of all countries. For, um, for corporate tax rates, and it's a significant lowering. Repatriation of overseas funds, so a lot of companies, <clears throat> by the way, I live and work in Silicon Valley, so, um, and, and also across the US with manufacturers, but my perspective from Silicon Valley is very globalized. Um, I live within 10 miles of Apple, Cisco, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, these are all companies that are around me that have a very global view and a perspective about globalization. Uh, the rest of the country, not so much. Um, if you look at the heartland of America, they're much more nationalistic and focused internally. So there, you, you know, I can see these differences in effects in terms of manufacturing across the country and what is happening there. Repatriation of overseas funds is really important. Um, during the tax reform, in the tax reform bill, it allowed for companies to bring uh, money back that was stored overseas. And the thought was that these companies would bring a lot of money home and start investing in the US. Well, surprise, <laughs> that didn't happen. Uh, most of the companies have bought back stock or are paying dividends or um, enriching the owners of the company. Uh, instead of investing. So there's some of that going on, but not to the extent that was expected. The two, 232 and 301 tariffs, um, I, enough said, you guys know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a fan of tariffs, and it's whipsawing, uh, it's got a whipsaw effect throughout the economy, including a lot of manufacturers who are buying component parts and finished products from China, who are very, unhappy um, with the tariffs. It reduced environmental regulations. So th there were, over time, an enormous amount of onerous regulations in manufacturing in the US, and some of those have been lifted um, without any respect to global warming or what that's doing to the environment. Advanced technologies being very rapidly deployed, um, things like uh, 
3D printing, robotics, AI, IoT, very important going forward. Everyone's adopting them. Everyone's trying it. It's moving very, very quickly. Um, interest in reshoring actually started in 2012 during the Barack Obama and Mitt Romney presidential election uh, when they were uh, both talking about how China had stolen the economy away from Americans. Um, and so it, it's not something that happened recently. It's really been ongoing for about seven or eight years. Um, the U.S. economy is also on, on track for a growth rate of 3% this year, which is excellent for us. Uh, and it's a very positive looking economy. But the deficit is also growing and is likely to be 22 trillion this year, which is likely to have the opposite effect. Um, and all indicators point that we're about to go into a recession. So that's likely to happen even in the last few days, the stock market has been significantly down. Corporate tax rate, as I mentioned before, went from about 38% down to 21%. That shows 25.7 there, and that includes the local taxes on average across the US. But it has made a huge difference in the how manufacturers feel about the environment. So it has a not only a, a, a hard number effect uh, on uh, revenues and so forth, but it has a psychological effect. And I think that is, in some cases, of equal important, importance. When manufacturers think the, the environment is good, they're more likely to invest. Um, so tax fuels have indeed fueled investment, um, but long-term investing is still weak. So manufacturers need to have an outlook of five to 10 years if they're gonna invest in factory, in capital equipment and so forth. And that part of the investing is still weak, which is an indicator that it's not all that, that robust. Um, the rebuilding of manufacturing isn't that robust and there's probably weakness in the future. Um, government policy definitely uh, affects manufacturing and uh, unemployment rate. Um, we, because of um, the unemployment rate going down significantly over the past year, starting, starting with um, about 2009 or so, um, uh, the Obama administration put in a number of uh, policies that caused the downward uh, trend of unemployment. And it is so low right now that most manufacturers in the U.S. are experiencing skilled labor shortages. So while they might like to invest, they may like to expand their factories, we have many examples at the Reshoring Institute of companies that tried to do that but didn't have the workers, couldn't find the workers, couldn't uh, teach the workers fast enough. And so that growth rate was stunted as a result. These are the, the tariffs, the 232 ter tariffs are on steel and aluminum. They went into effect last summer and there are three tranches of the Chinese tariffs. Two of them are at 25% now, the third tranche is at 10%, likely to go to 25% in, in 90 days. There was a 90 day pause put on it. Uh, and that's again gonna have a pretty negative effect. And we know, especially from a Silicon Valley perspective, uh, that we have uh, deteriorating global relationships and that's causing uh, some uh, consternation with respect to growth. Um, there's a shifting of production from China and the, with the tariff policies, I think the Trump administration naively thought that that would mean all these companies would bring manufacturing back to the US, which um, is indeed very naive because most of the companies are, that are moving out of China to avoid the tariffs are actually moving to other low cost countries, such as Vietnam and Thailand, Indonesia, Bangladesh and so forth. They're not actually coming back to the US. Um, increasing cost of raw materials due to the tariffs um, are severely hurting US manufacturers uh, and even resulting in plant shutdowns. So General Motors announced five plant closures, 14,000 workers just last week. Um, our policy, though, is really important, and um, the policymakers on the federal level are the ones that are driving the big leaps in innovation. In 2014, we passed the, the Revitalized American Manufacturing Act, which invested in advanced technologies, advanced manufacturing, 
and all kinds of new innovative breakthroughs. Um, and this uh, resulted in companies like uh, uh, one in Silicon Valley that's very close to me that Dr. Kinkle and I visited called Nextflex that makes uh, printed circuit boards on sort of a, a very thin film like a plastic wrap. And they're flexible and, and, and can be used for all kinds of applications. That was one of the funded um, companies in, in, under this initiative. And they've designed a lot of breakthrough technologies that's really important. So the government enacts or enables those kind of breakthrough thinkings and technologies. Um, and then the companies take it from there. So in this case, this company went uh, uh, with private funding and is now on its own, no longer taking any government money. Um, so there's an upside and a downside. So the upside of outlook for manufacturing is it's complicated for sure. The upside, the corporate tax reductions, the pro-manufacturing environment, which always happens under a Republican government, not just this one, but manufacturers are more likely to be conservative Republicans. And so under a Republican administration, they usually do better. That's, that's very common. Um, reduced environmental regulations, that's an upside for most manufacturers. State and local in incentives, so not only do we have an overarching federal government, but each state and each local uh, area also has policies and incentives to offer and so forth. Um, innovation and automation is certainly driving factors in reducing costs and building expansion um, components of factories. A support for new technologies, but the downside. So there's an upside, you know, and 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 manufacturing is doing well in the U.S., but there's a big downside as well. Um, the tariffs, of course, are causing a lot of havoc and uh, a lot of disappointment by manufacturing. Um, deteriorating global relationships. So when we have these big global companies, and now all of a sudden there's a difficult relationship with China or with um, any of the European nations, this, this affects the outlook and how they're investing and how they want to go forward. Reduced environmental regulations. So while they have reduced that, you know, most of us are very worried about the U.S. exiting the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, most of us don't think that's a good idea. Uh, and that causes, you know, a difference in, in opinion and how we go forward. Um, the Trump administration has also lowered fuel economy standards. Uh, and so in a lot of uh, states, you can sell automotive uh, products that are lower on fuel economy. However, there are other states like California, where I live, where um, there is no lowering of those, econ those uh, fuel economy standards. So there's differences in the way the policy is executed. Worker, worker shortages across the nation. Um, a very nationalistic view, which to me is a downside, especially since most companies, industrial companies, not only produce for uh, the nation, but they also produce for exports. And if we have a nationalistic view, that, that's just not going to help these companies with the export market. A lot of short-term thinking and an onerous amount of national debt. This is us. I would encourage you to visit our website. It's reshoringinstitute.org. We have um, posted all of the research that we do there uh, and uh, case studies, a lot of uh, good information on reshoring that I think you might think is helpful. And finally, I just want to thank Lisa and all the makers for a really great three years and in being involved in these kind of forums. It's really good for us, and uh, hopefully it's good for all of you as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rosemary. Um, by the way, you're not the only one that wakes up in the morning worrying about which tweets uh, have been posted. Uh, there's somebody else here who wakes up in the morning. Thanks to the time difference, you probably know when you wake up that some of the worst tweets have already been posted because you're both living probably close to each other. We are very we are delighted to have uh, John Zeisman with us. John is uh, as a professor of political science at Berkeley. <laughs> is an extremely well-known uh, political scientist uh, originally in the early days of his career just because you told me that story a few times uh, you've been you you studied Europe a lot right uh, and you can it continues to be extremely uh, familiar and uh, and also ex uh, very frequently visiting uh, Europe extremely involved also with 
the industrial transformation in Europe uh, through academic collaborations and uh, in many countries in Europe, and uh, an extremely sharp observer of the industrial policy in many parts of the world. Uh, so, John, uh, I don't know how much you worried about the tweets, but uh, you certainly are welcome uh, to be here. Every time John is in this continent, we find it doesn't have to be in Brussels, but we find a way to bring him here. So I'm so I'm so happy that we managed to bring you here uh, today for this uh, uh, event. Well, thank you, thank you, Andrea. I should say, and I'll try and be brief. Uh, so we can all uh, go on with this. Uh, I welcomed Andrea's suggestion that I join today precisely because I wanted to listen and learn. And I want to compliment you all on what has obviously been an enormously productive and interesting project. And I look forward to looking at the results of it uh, in very and concrete ways. Uh, whether we call the project uh, or talk about Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution, what all the labels have in common is that we're really talking about the development, the diffusion, and the deployment of intelligent tools and systems. And the question is, how do we do that? How do we go about building them? Now, with that in mind, and with the idea of future collaborations uh, looking forward, uh, we at Berkeley had set up a project which we call WITS. Uh, like, you know, keep your wits about you while this transformation is going on. So you can find it at wits.berkeley.edu, work in an era of intelligent tools and systems, uh, which is really an integrated project of social scientists, technologists, uh, that is, those who are building 3D systems, those who are uh, the, uh, involved in the future of AI. Stuart Russell, for those of you who know, uh, the AI world is a, is a perfect instance, Ken Goldberg in robotics and so forth. Uh, and what I think is also useful here, as along with policymakers uh, who, uh, who are past and future, uh, 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 we're looking forward to finding ways of, of working with you. Uh, Stuart Russell's a Brit. Ken Goldberg grew up in Nigeria. Uh, the fellow who does 3D printing, Bjorn Hartman, came out of Göttingen. So that, in fact, there's a very international perspective in the way in which we go uh, about things. Um, now, in order to uh, sort of move things forward and uh, really welcome a collaboration going forward, I'm going to just make three concrete remarks that might be useful, since one of the tasks uh, of having a name that ends in Z, or starts in Z, is I'm usually the last speaker, and so that by then everybody said everything, so I'm used to sort of sitting here and thinking about what else can I say that might in fact be, uh, be helpful. And I'm going to resist opening in a conversation about America, because it would depress us and everyone else. Uh, so let me just make three quick remarks. The first is, that, and I think the project comes to this and addresses it, but I'm going to be explicit, which is it's a very delicate line to walk between or amongst hype and denial, uh, hype and panic. Uh, you know, that is, if I look at many of these kinds of projects, there was a long time when robots, the debate was, Will robots do away with drudgery? Will robots do away with all work? It's the end of the universe. I mean, you know, AI will turn us all into pets. Uh, my friend Stuart Russell uh, and others really are concerned about that. I think he's dead wrong, uh, but he's very smart, and I can't dismiss what he, uh, what he has to say. Platform, uh, another one of these tools, platforms, in fact, is either, you know, the, uh, the end of competitive marketplaces that need to be in some way reined in, or, in fact, the real fulfillment of the possibilities of, uh, uh, of the Internet. And then lastly, and I risk saying this, is the whole crypto blockchain debate. And those of you who know my views on this, uh, cryptocurrencies are tulips, ICOs are scams and Ponzi schemes, and blockchain may have a few concrete applications. We'll find out. Uh, so that that said, uh, at the same time in work I've done over many years here, I've watched European uh, look at modern technologies, dismiss te Silicon Valley. I had a very senior French friend uh, once say, Silicon Valley va retourner au sable, Silicon Valley is going back to the sand. You know, well, it didn't quite do that. And cloud computing, which a number of Danish firms I knew and worked with, uh, in fact, mm -hmm. really thought that it was of no court importance. It was just an inconvenient way of doing computing and completely missed 
what in fact became the future. So that's the first is how do you actually know about these technologies? It's part of what we're trying to do is to have this conversation so we're really sitting in the midst of a lot of that and something we're very interested in. The second is the key here is how the tools are deployed. Uh, my own concern, along with green, which because we did do a book years ago called Can Green Sustain Growth? Uh, From the Religion to the Reality of Sustainable Communities. Um, in any case, uh, is really the, uh, what I would call healthy communities. And a key to that is really whether or not you develop and sustain uh, productivity in an equitable way in which the workforces fully participate. Now, the question of that really comes down, in my view, to how you view the workforces themselves. Uh, do you have a good job strategy in which, as many German companies do, take considerable uh, value out of their workforces and believe that the core of their own competitive position is the ability to grow those skills and to deploy them, or a Danish company called Unimerco, which basically hinges on the way in which it effectively integrates knowledge and technology. Or is, are, are workers an asset or are they a cost? If they're a cost, you use these new tools to displace them. If they're an asset, you try and build with them. Now, that leads to the second crucial point. A key to this is what the user interfaces are. Uh, because in fact, I mean, if we all think about it, uh, what kind of computer skills would it be required to operate a naked uh, Unix box uh, to print, right? I had to do that once many years ago. We had an emergency. Reagan had come into office. They were threatening us over a project. We had to deliver something to Washington the next day uh, or get in a lot of trouble, and I had to get the thing printed so we could give it to somebody to get on an airplane. And, you know, it was pretty hard in those days. Now what would we do? You know, you'd sort of look at your computer and you'd push print. And it's called a user interface. It's called, you know, uh, the entire Microsoft Office setup changes what kind of skills we need. And I emphasize that because we can't address the question of skills if we don't address how the tools are designed, how they're being organized, and how they're being deployed, because that then changes what the work organization is. And, and uh, Hannah Shapiro in Denmark, who some of you may know, would emphasize enormously that a critical part of this story is not the tools, it's work organization itself, the work of people like Sabine Pfeiffer in Germany and, and, and so on. So uh, I would emphasize that as we all go forward, we think about how we grow uh, workforces and user interfaces and the technologies in ways that are complementary in the uh, way they're used. The last is uh, a comment on business strategy, since an enormous part of this in the end is about business strategy. It's what kind of strategies the companies actually adopt. And I've really had the pleasure over 4,000 years. I mean, you know, I always told my students that I was from the age of the early dinosaurs, you know. Uh, but those early dinosaurs in our project concluded Bob Noyce, who founded Intel, Jerry Sanders, who founded uh, uh, AMD and so forth, who helped us start uh, our, our our programs. Uh, but the key here is to not get too abstract about what these technologies are. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely true that we're going from concrete, uh, tangible to intangible assets. Another way of saying that is what we always say is the emergence of services with everything. Uh, you know, I, there's a, a Finnish firm that I used to do some things with called Cargo Tech, and it has a competitor in Denmark called Kone uh, Cranes, and they would try and compete with the Chinese in selling cranes. Well, the Chinese make a lot of cranes. It's the national bird. There's so many cranes around. If you go to China, everything's getting built. So that, in fact, the, uh, you know, the question was, they're going to make cheap cranes. What do you do faced with this? Well, Cargo Tech started selling uh, or claiming it was going to sell port management services, okay? And to do that, it bought a platform firm in Oakland, California, about a mile from where I live in Berkeley, uh, that in fact it could integrate its equipment into a port management and say, go buy your Chinese equipment, but if you want your port to work, you probably ought to buy our system. And Komatsu, uh, which is a Japanese construction firm, has uh, uh, adopted a, a strategy of open platforms. Uh, precisely so that its competitors' equipment can operate in platforms so it can say to its customers, you know, sure, you know, you can put anybody's equipment and we'll help you manage it. Does it give them competitive advantage? Of course it does. 
So it's really about an intangible, uh, this whole set of, of other things. And so it's really about um, this uh, transformation in how people conceive and understand uh, what their business strategies are given this set of new and emerging tools. Uh, and I think those are the, the kinds of things we're interested in uh, and we have, uh, uh, we welcome working with that. I should say, the fellow who runs the Institute for Transportation Studies and driverless vehicles and all that uh, is from your neighboring country, your France. He's actually a major in the French Army, Polytechnique, and then in, uh, for, uh, may, you know, Stuart Russell is uh, British. I mean, we go, th and that's still the EU at least till next week, you know, and maybe even past that. I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic actually that the vote will fail there'll be a second. I'm, I'm, oh, I put bets down on that about a year ago, so, uh, you know, what? No, uh, 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 no on uh, 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 one bottle of champagne against a case. I said, <laughs> okay. In any case, it's a great pleasure to be here. I really have enjoyed this, and I look forward to learning, and it is true. The first book I wrote was called, uh, in, in French, was called L'Industrie Française entre le marché et l'État. So I've always been working on these kinds of questions since for more decades than I want to acknowledge. Thank you. Thanks, John, as always. Uh, I will now, well, I, I cut uh, drastically my own wrap-up. I want to know if there are questions uh, or uh, requests for clarifications from the floor before we wrap up. There's one here. Let me see if uh, others want to uh, take the floor or the, the appetite for knowledge has been surpassed by the appetite for food. And they say, uh, okay, we go here with uh, Ada and then. Thank you. <coughs> my name is Joost van Eersel. I have a question to our two American guests. Um, Buckle up. Um, uh, Rosemary, you uh, mentioned that uh, <coughs> there is a growing distance in the, the administration to uh, the international framework, the IMF, WTO, uh, the whole lot. The basic system in Europe is based, and all thoughts about industrial policy in Europe hitherto have been based on a multilateral open market strategy. Uh, when we see this undermined, uh, we have to reflect what should be the answer. And now my question to you is this. Is this just uh, uh, an incident that is coming up uh, under the Trump administration and uh, um, they, will, uh, they will change it uh, uh, along the, um, uh, the bad experiences they, uh, they will suffer or the, the economy will suffer from? Or is it more basic in the states that um, uh, we should give up to this system uh, the, the free world has to organize itself differently. We have to be superior to the others, and then the others follow us. And it is more inspired by self, uh, uh, by doing things so, so uh, uh, by ourselves than in that multinational framework. How do, how do you feel that? Well, first of all, I would say I, ho I hope the Trump administration is over shortly, uh, at least in two years, and we can we can vote them out. Uh, so, uh, but to answer your question, it, it feels like we're in fast forward all the time. So, one of the things is the we were um, in desperate need of a tax reduction. There's no question about that. So we were we had too high of a corporate tax rate, and so um, revamping the tax structure in the U.S. is important, and that's longer lasting, and will continue on. Um, and so I think that's helpful for uh, the positive psychological environment as well as the economic environment for investment and manufacturing. That's very good. 
Um, but you know, it feels like we're testing a lot of things and we may push ahead a little bit and then something will happen and we'll pull back. And that, that's kind of what it feels like right now. Um, so I don't know how much of it is lasting. With respect to the international question, there, it, there's absolutely no question in my mind, we are in a globalized economy. Right? And it may change, I mean, may, maybe um, China won't be you know, 90% of what we're doing, maybe it will now be spread across the globe more effectively. But we all now work and trade with each other and we talk globally. I mean, we're part of the makers group, that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. Um, you know, we, we look at the internet, we can source products from anywhere in the world by going on the internet and finding vendors. You, you can't put that all back nationally, it's just not going to happen. We've also, we have done a number of projects, one with a company that um, is manufacturing currently in China and they want to open a U.S. factory and we were helping them uh, over the last few months um, find a location to manufacture in the U.S. and we also took their top 20 manu their top 20 suppliers by value. So we looked at their bill of material, we took their top 20 suppliers and we tried to find, they were currently uh, supplying or uh, sourcing all of those top 20 in Asia, not all China, but in Asia. And we tried to find similar suppliers in the US and we, out of 20, we found four that were kind of competitively priced, 16 that were not. And of the four that were competitively priced, they had no capacity to take new orders. So, you know, from a globalization perspective, it may be that we have a desire to manufacture or set up manufacturing in the U.S., but our suppliers are still overseas and will continue to be. You know, we're in this global economy. You, you can't just withdraw from it, no matter what anybody says. Okay, let's see if anybody says differently. Uh, John, you? Well, I think <laughs> if, we, we, if we clearly have a global economy, the question becomes, what happens to the institutions of that global economy over the next years? And the first question is how much permanent damage is done in this four-year period uh, and how much has to be repaired and can it be repaired? And partly whether or not then there's a political mood uh, to do that. Uh, I think, you know, the question is who becomes the next president, but I think that for the most part the Democratic Party and the leadership in the Democratic Party would share the view that uh, multilateral, multinational institutions are the foundations of this global uh, economy. Part of the question when I say how much damage is done, this trade war with China is foolish uh, in the way it's framed. Uh, you know, that is much of the way in which the open trade system and American advantage was created was in joint deals with Europe. Uh, the Europe and America set the frame, America leadership with Europe set the frame in which the rest of the international negotiations that allowed the opening of these global systems to actually take place. China's a real problem. <coughs> I mean, it's partly because it has a huge market that it can develop alternative technologies internally, and we'll see how fast that happens. Uh, and because it is, in fact, stealing technology right and left, and that's a real issue. The way of dealing with that was TPP, okay? Because underneath it, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was, in fact, the mechanism to address that. It wasn't a great deal. I mean, it was, it had a lot of problems, and if, if somebody had come in, I would have wanted to see it renegotiated marginally. But TPP done with Europe, uh, that then said you basically put put pressure on China. Can't bully Trump tries to bully everybody about everything with the same stick, and it doesn't work. Uh, so that in fact we'll see where it goes. Thanks, John. Let me see if there are more questions. Uh, it's interesting that we uh, we we went uh, in the in the morning during the morning from very place based, very local considerations to the to the actually the, the highest possible level of, uh, of international trade and, uh, and the future of geopolitics. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, um, on my side, I think it's been a very rewarding morning uh, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, a, a very nice end of a, of a fantastic project uh, uh, for now. Uh, we see, I mean, this is love, I think, uh, uh, still uh, uh, is pushing Lisa to, to consider doing something more in this respect. I think that the, the, the issues that, are, that have been thrown on the table are so interesting that it would be uh, a, a crime to leave it there. Uh, um, on, on my side, I think I want to just to offer a couple of considerations to wrap up. The first is, um, 
I think we've heard uh, um, in several occasions from, from several presenters uh, uh, the, um, uh, the similar, let's say, framing of, of issues. So Peter uh, either had a slide when he was showing good governance of an enabling condition for uh, uh, smart specialization. Uh, Sandrine mentioned also the needs to, to really uh, uh, map the system, exploit the linkages and the synergies. That is, I think, uh, extremely important. I wonder whether good governance, or be besides being a, uh, a condition, can also be become a little bit more of a conditionality uh, in, uh, in, the, in regional funds. Uh, because I think the, uh, the establishment of trust between institutions is probably the missing link in, on, of much of the European projects today. And I think there are many ways of achieving this, but good governance and, to, in, in my opinion, better regulation in particular and good administration are a part of that link uh, uh, that still undermines the functioning of this very complex multi-level governance. Now, uh, yesterday I gave a talk uh, which is on, on experimental policy making was probably the most, uh, um, let's say, adventures that I could give uh, in front of the legal service of the European Parliament talking about experimentation in policy making was a little bit of a stretch, I admit. But I think that this is something that uh, all policy makers should, uh, should get to grips with. Uh, the idea that policy making has to become more experimental. The learning component in, in policy making in a multi-level governance of the EU has to become uh, a major component. It's a bit like we moved from a from an exante versus exposed phases in policy making to really looking at constant monitoring of the markets in between, which is of course much more complicated. It requires a lot more data, a, more, a lot more understanding and, uh, and, and ability to really uh, gather sources of information from where they could be coming from. Um, so, and so yesterday in that talk I said something, since everybody says data is the new oil, I said, okay, let's propose something different. I do believe trust is the new oil. Uh, it's trust in, uh, in blockchain, it's trust in, uh, in, uh, in complex industrial relationships, it's trust between the, legal, the let's say, the, the workers and, and the employers is trust in many in many other aspects and it's trust also what we lack in many aspects of our policy making. Final consideration, uh, we've been working on this at SAPS in particular, I've, I've done a lot of work uh, with my friend and colleague Nicholas Ashford from the MIT on the issue of aligning policies for um, sustainable innovation and decarbonization in Europe and this is something that the OECD has, has done a lot uh, in terms of policy alignment or what in some uh, other um, uh, fields and domains is called the policy coherence for sustainable development. Uh, I really do think we need that. Um, and I don't know if we can um, sustain that, but there's certainly appetite and need in Europe for more policy alignment at the European level, uh, between institutions in different policy fields, uh, and also in the multi-level perspective. If you think about how the agenda of many member states is completely de deviating from the so-called Agenda 2030. So my take in this is that we need a strong Agenda 2030, one that is really broken down also, contrary to what unfortunately we didn't manage to do in Europe 2020, at the national and at the local level, uh, something that is actionable at the local level. And we need to do this in all aspects of policy making. Again, I give you the, the experience on, on the discussion on AI. I had the first meeting on the AI high level expert group, DG Connect came and they said, we want to have, our goal is to establish competitiveness in AI. And they never mentioned Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals, for example. And I do believe that if you look at AI and robotics, but many other of these technologies, it makes a, a big difference to analyze them from, a, let's say, a GDP perspective, or ask yourself, how are these technologies gonna help us achieve the goal of full and decent employment, which is one of the 17. Because if you look at this from that lens, then you have to put the workers in. What about inequality then? What about gender? What about sustainable uh, use of land? And, 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 and many other things that technology can help us achieve. So as a wrap up, I would say, in the future, it would be important to, rather than focusing on how to make robots happier, and asking ourselves, how can, how can Europe do something for technology or what can Europe do for technology and the technological transformation to reverse the question and ask ourselves, how can the new set, uh, the new so-called technological stack uh, that is emerging help Europe achieve its own goals and realize its vision for the medium term? That is a little bit what I gathered this morning, and uh, uh, I would gently push you or nudge you downstairs because it's going to be lunch, and I think lunch is going to be an opportunity to discuss about Trump, about many other things, not necessarily only about uh, about the tweets. Okay, so thanks a lot for all of you. Thanks to Lisa in particular for 
animating and leading all this. Uh, thanks to all the makers in the room and all the non-makers in the sense that you don't participate, you didn't participate in the project. You still certainly are makers of something, uh, and you're all invited to lunch, and uh, uh, we continue our conversation. Thank you. <laughs>